A game changer or business as usual? Will the U.S.-Saudi alliance survive the fallout from a gruesome killing and cover-up? With leading members of Congress slamming the Saudi leadership for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, could this be a tipping point? Or will the kingdom get away with murder? Plus, why some Americans think it's time to shake up their country's relations with the House of Saud. I've always thought it was absolutely disgusting that the U.S. had these close relations with the regime that is so repressive internally. Hello, I'm Rida Fakhri in Washington with a look at the implications this could have on the U.S.-Saudi affair. Welcome to the program. The murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi has cast a long shadow over the United States' decades-old relationship with Saudi Arabia. It has prompted calls from leading members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans alike, for the U.S. administration to take strong action against Saudi Arabia and its Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And while President Trump is still reluctant to act, he has been pressured by his Republican allies in Congress to change his tone and try to bridge the divide. $3 billion, $533 million, $525 million. I would not be in favor of stopping a country from spending $110 billion, which is an all-time record. There's not there's no enough money in the world for us to buy back our credibility on human rights. I, mean, I can just tell you that in Congress right now, there is no pro-Saudi element that's going to stick with our relationship with Saudi Arabia as it's currently structured. Saudi Arabia has been a really great ally. They've been one of the biggest investors, maybe the biggest investor in our country. Uh, they are doing hundreds of billions of dollars worth of investments and, you know, so many jobs, so many jobs. If Saudi Arabia took a U.S. resident, lured him into a consulate and killed him, it's time for the United States to rethink our military, political, uh, and economic relationship with Saudi Arabia. And here's what we can do for the world. We can stand up against allies, not just enemies, who abuse power. The MBS figure is, to me, toxic. This guy is a wrecking ball. He had this guy murdered in a consulate in Turkey. This guy's got to go. What I would do, I know what I'm going to do. We're going to sanction the hell out of Saudi Arabia. There are other ways of uh, punishing. punishing, to use a word that's a pretty harsh word, but it's true. It was a total fiasco from day one, from the thought. Whoever put it in their minds, that was not a good thought. The process was no good. The execution was no good. And the cover-up, if you want to call it that, was certainly no good. Murder is murder. And I don't care who they get upset. So how then will the growing rift between Congress and the White House affect the future of U.S.-Saudi relations? I'm joined by Brian McKeown. He was a senior national security official at the White House and the Pentagon under President Obama. He was also the Democratic Party's chief counsel in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Also with us, Jim Hansen, president of the Security Studies Group, a conservative think tank here in Washington. He's also a former member of the U.S. Army Special Forces. Brian McKeown, to you first. For a month, we've been hearing just about everything from the Saudis, the deafening 17-day-long silence, the initial denials, the rogue uh, agent theory, the fist fight, and now the fact that, yes, it may have been a premeditated murder, but don't worry, we'll take care of it. A few people have exceeded their authority, but everything's under control. We shall try them in our own courts. Is any of this going to fly here in Washington, both at the White House and Congress? Well, I think there are probably different views between the White House and members of Congress. First of all, there are 535 members of Congress, so it's always dangerous to say you know what Congress as a body thinks until the Congress votes. But there are a lot of members of Congress who I think are quite upset with uh, the behavior of Saudi Arabia, both in the apparent murder of Mr. Khashoggi and the fact that the Saudi government lied to the United States And government. interestingly, some uh, strong Republican voices. Could that make any serious difference? I do think it makes a difference. I think. Th I think a line has been crossed uh, that will affect how the Congress views the U.S.-Saudi relationship. 
And I think if the White House thinks that this will blow over or that this can be swept under the rug, I think they're making a very bad miscalculation. Are they making a bad miscalculation, Jim Hansen? Because the, the White House, uh, President Trump and his close entourage seem to be doing all they can to assist in a damage control operation uh, in Riyadh. W what is likely to happen? I think there will be some sort of, of condemnation. I don't think there's going to be any major action like stopping the arms sales or actual sanctions against the Saudis. Um, I think at this point, they're going to let the Saudis go ahead and make the people who conducted this operation accountable. You know, there was a standing order to bring But, but hold Saudi on, let the people who, who conducted the operation, what about the people who ordered the operation? Is there any, any uh, possibility whatsoever that uh, the ambitious crown prince, with we all know his strong grip on power, mm -hmm. could have allowed this operation to happen, this audacious operation, without his own knowledge, not to say without his own direct orders? There's no proof he did. I mean, right now the British have an But could you imagine he didn't? Um, I think it's, uh, it's unlikely. However, absent proof, we don't go on unlikely. We don't make major strategic decisions for the United States national interest based on whether something might have happened or was likely to happen. But if he so, did, there is growing evidence that he might have, at least circumstantial okay. evidence pointing to him. What should then happen? Uh, nothing based on circumstantial evidence and, and things pointing to it happening. What we're looking at is if, they, if the Saudis hold people accountable and conduct a legitimate investigation and do what they're supposed to do as a sovereign nation, the U.S. then decides what is the importance of this one person's death versus our interest in the region as, with Saudis as an ally. How do you see this, Brian McKeon? Is this just to quote Jim Hansen, just circumstantial evidence, or is there a lot of evidence piling up that point in one direction, as we say, 15 Saudi agents reportedly traveled to Istanbul to take care of this operation. Five among these 15 are part of the close uh, security detail belonging to the, the Crown Prince himself. There's certainly a lot of evidence that this was directed by senior officials in the Saudi government. I don't know that we have any evidence that proves that the Crown Prince ordered it or acquiesced in it. Uh, but in a court of law in the United States, and I think in a lot of European countries, you can be convicted on only circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is not, not, doesn't mean that it's not important or dispositive evidence. But, but is the world being taken for a ride here? The United States, of course, uh, included. Is it believable that these men would have gone rogue and decided to go off on their own, charter a private jet, and hop, on, hop over to Istanbul just to conduct uh, uh, you know, uh, operation to, to interview Khashoggi, not more. It seems very likely they were coming to bring him back to the kingdom. And I think the, the thing that we don't know for certain is whether they intended to murder him inside the consulate. Now, there have been, the Turks have leaked information that there was a bone saw used to, to carve up the body. I don't know that we have any more evidence than that uh, of that occurring, but the fact that if that is true, you don't bring a bone saw to somebody in a case where you're kidnapping. That's pretty strong evidence they did intend to kill him. You, you don't bring a, a bone saw. And, and do you think that the um, Saudis have overreached here in this operation, that they've displayed more than just a bit of arrogance by even attempting to kidnap Khashoggi? You know, they have what's known as a standing order to bring dissident citizens back to the kingdom, whether through bribery, whether through you know, intimidation or whatever means to try and bring them back into the fold and stop them from causing trouble overseas. But uh, that, uh, that's extrajudicial. It is not extrajudicial in the, in the Saudi system because it's a standing order. It's likely to be removed as a result of this. You know, and that goes to the point of whether or not uh, Mohammed bin Salman authorized this the standing order gave the people who conducted the operation, who were fairly high in the intelligence service, permission to do so. So he didn't have to actually well, go ahead and personally he, chop off on He didn't have to, but it takes me back to my question, if I can get a straight answer here from you, Jim Hansen. Just sweeping this under the rug and pretend it like it never happened, is that good for U.S. foreign policy? Has it been swept under the rug? We had a massive media firestorm, which was driven in a lot of cases by the stories about bone saws and extradition teams and all that. I don't think it's been swept under anything. I think it's received remarkable scrutiny, given that it's not that significant an event. But the White House uh, hasn't acted on it beyond saying that this was the worst cover-up ever. Do they need to? I mean, is there a requirement for the White House to act on do, it? Do they need to? Brian McKeon, you advised President Obama. Would any of this have happened under his watch? And, what, and how would he have reacted? Well, I would say it is a pretty significant event. Uh, taking a, a citizen and essentially either kidnapping or murdering them on foreign soil is 
is quite a significant overstep by any nation, whether it's an ally of the United States or not. Yet the State Department is saying that we still need and we still continue to seek all relevant facts in this case. I just wonder what more evidence do they need? We already know that the director of the CIA has heard in Istanbul the alleged audio tape of the killing. Right, and presumably it's been reported that she has briefed the president on this. So I, I would expect that between our conversations with the Turks and with the Saudi government and with whatever intelligence that we have or that has been shared with the United States by uh, the government of Turkey or the United Kingdom, we probably know quite a bit about what has happened and the government is still assessing what to do about that and watching how the Saudi government handles it. And is it all up to Congress to do something about it? Well, in the first instance, it's up to the administration to have some kind of response. If they choose not to have one, I think Congress will respond. Well, it feels like the initial outrage in Congress has died down somewhat. I mean, the Saudis no doubt were banking on the fact that we live in a 24-7 news cycle, mm -hmm. that the story will eventually move to something else. And for the most part, it has, and the midterm elections are just around the corner. Is this, is, is this do, it on this story? Well, Congress doesn't do foreign policy. That's the executive branch's job. So the president's going to decide, is the death of Khashoggi as horrific as it was and as bad an idea as it seems to have been, more important than the alliance we have? And, and President Trump's made a fairly significant investment in Mohammed bin Salman as a partner with him in the region. So I think given that, I, I think he's going to make the strategic calculation that we will continue to be very close allies with the Saudis. But, but is that wise? You say he has invested quite heavily in Mohammed bin Salman. There's no doubt that he has. But given what we know now, at least the suspicions surrounding Mohammed bin Salman's uh, uh, possible role in this, shouldn't he cut his losses and reassess? Oh, absolutely not. I think Mohammed bin Salman has done more than any leader in the Arab world during my lifetime to move us towards peace. He's modernizing in the, the land where the two mosques live and doing things that no one has had the guts to do. He shut down the money to the Wahhabist extremists. He's letting women have expanded rights in a massive way. And that's something that's a great thing for everybody in Saudi Arabia. Again, but we get back to this notion of the great reformer that the Saudis have been peddling in this country. But just as a Saudi friend remind, reminded me a couple of days ago, it was his uncle back in 2011 who started this push towards social economic mm -hmm. modernization and reform. And he gave women in Saudi Arabia the right to vote and run in municipal elections. He actually was the first to speak about women uh, beginning to drive eventually. So mm -hmm. is, is, Mo is Mohammed bin Salman given way too much credit for being the reformer? If he's not the guy who started it, he's definitely the one who's pushing it right now. And he's put a tremendous target on himself by cutting off the money to the extremists, by allowing these, these reforms to happen. And consequently, it's much more difficult to, to keep that going when things like the, the Khashoggi incident happen. Brian McKeown, do you see it this way? Because he's also jailed a lot of women activists who were, who were fighting for the, uh, for the right to, to drive. At best, it's a very mixed picture. He has initiated some reforms that are encouraging if they are carried through. But he's engaged in a lot of impetuous and rash acts. The blockade of Qatar. Uh, has split the Gulf Cooperation Council at a time that when we and the Saudis want to unite the GCC to counter Iran's uh, malign influence in the region. The basically kidnapping of the Prime Minister of Lebanon uh, temporarily. Nobody's really explained why that occurred. Which he joked it, about the other day. His reaction to uh, the government of Canada being critical of a human rights issue in, in Saudi Arabia complete overreaction, canceled uh, various student exchanges and, and threatened other retribution. Uh, and the war in Yemen, they might have had a legitimate reason to start it because of the concerns about their southern border with the Houthis taking over in, in, uh, in Sana'a. But it's gone on for over three years now. It's clear there is not a military solution. They're engaged in a lot of indiscriminate air attacks. The United States has tried to advise them and improve their targeting and right th there are members of Congress who I think are quite impatient with the war in Yemen and will probably move to s cut back or curtail U.S. support. For and again on top of all that an incident uh, you didn't mention here but we've talked about it uh, uh, before the fact that he took on so many of his rivals within the Saudi royal family the business community extorted millions of dollars out of them according to U.S. intelligence he also took 
an extremely harsh line against his own mother, placing her under house arrest because apparently, and this is according to US intelligence documents and intercepts, because yeah. she apparently was against his plan for a power grab. She was afraid that it might divide the family. Well, and the other thing is he has effectively sidelined a, a long-standing, very good partner of the United States in counterterrorism, Mohammed bin Nayef. Uh, so he, he has consolidated power. The king has given him that long leash of authority. And I think, I think there are reasons to be concerned about whether he's up to the job of, of running the country. But is there any doubt that he pushed aside uh, the former crown prince, whom you've just mentioned, because President Trump wanted him as, quote, his man at the top in Saudi Arabia? I'm not sure I can attribute that to President Trump's investment in Saudi Arabia. I think it's just old-fashioned politics of I mean, clearly Jared Kushner had lots of hopes for this young man. I think man. it's just old-fashioned politics of consolidating power. If, you're, if you've got a chance to grab for the brass ring, uh, what do you do? You sideline your biggest rival. That's, that's not terribly surprising, particularly in an authoritarian Just a quick state. yes or no. Is this relationship going to, to change, or will it continue? I don't think there's a yes or no answer to that. We can, we, for strategic reasons, and this is where we agree, we need to have a relationship with the Saudis. But I think it bears a reassessment. Of Jim Hansen? We'll continue with Mohammed bin Salman at the helm. Jim Hansen and Brian McKeon, thank you both very much indeed for coming in. So who is MBS and what does he bring to the Saudi kingdom? Reform or oppression? During his highly publicized visit to the United States last March, the Crown Prince received a hero's welcome, meeting with a long list of American influencers. His two-week tour introduced him to the American public as the reformer. He is just 32 years old, and the Crown Prince is already one of the most powerful leaders in the Middle East. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is architect of some of the major social, economic, and political reforms that are underway there. What you feel when you're in Saudi Arabia, he's not just leading this from the top down. Whoa, okay. it let is me, exploding let me, from the bottom up. During the interview, he said to me, do not say that I am reforming Islam. I am restoring Islam. The 32-year-old prince is distancing himself from hardline Islam, progressing women's rights, and looking past oil for income. He's lifted the, the prohibition on women driving. He's introduced public entertainment, such as concerts. And he's, he's allowed cinemas to open. Saudi Arabia is going to invest in, in the movie business now, the opening up the theaters and letting women in. I think Black Panther is the first movie that's going to be shown there. And he compares himself to the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and says, I'm going to take my state in a kind of visionary direction. Everyone he seems to meet, he's, he's sort of a master salesman. He, he's remaking the Saudi brand. Well, this carefully cultivated and widely promoted image of the crown prince as a reformer is a far cry from the repressive actions he's ordered both in and outside the kingdom. In November 2017, the Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri was summoned to Riyadh held against his will and forced to announce his resignation in a televised address. Later that month, 200 Saudi princes, ministers, and wealthy businessmen were held at the Ritz-Carlton in Riyadh as part of a so-called anti-corruption campaign. The men were forced to hand over billions of dollars in cash and assets in exchange for their freedom. And in March 2015, Mohammed bin Salman, then the world's youngest defense minister, launched a devastating military campaign in Yemen, which has killed thousands of civilians, many of them children. The UN estimates that more than 50,000 have died as a result of the ongoing famine due to the war. So how has this aggressive, many would argue reckless, foreign policy affected the prevailing narrative and image of Saudi Arabia's de facto leader here in the United States? Stephen Sesh is a former US ambassador to Yemen. Ambassador Sesh, did Americans, did the world need this killing of Jamal Khashoggi to know what they were dealing with? It'd be tragic to think that's the case, but I do believe it has had a galvanizing effect on some public opinion now. I think it has really sharpened the focus and shined, shown a much brighter light on the fact that there are these really bad miscalculations and poor judgments being exercised by the leadership in Saudi Arabia, and Yemen is principal among them. But do you agree with those who say that MBS had long ago revealed his true character through his vicious actions in Yemen? 
Well, I think what we've seen over the course of three and a half years now, even longer than that, is a, a complete disregard for the human cost of exercising Saudi prerogative in a neighboring country in this kind of blind pursuit of an effort to push back against the, the alleged Iranian threat and presence in Yemen and, a, and an attempt by Saudi Arabia to secure its southern border from what it perceives as a threat posed by the Houthi rebels. Sure, it's all well and good to say that, but could this any... Could any of this have happened without the support of the Trump administration? I think it could have. I, they would have gone elsewhere for the weapons. They would have gone elsewhere for the intelligence. So it may have been even worse in some fashion, if that's possible. But I do think that they would have done this in any camp. They didn't ask us at the beginning of the war in 2015, should we going to do this? They said, basically, we are going to do this. And I think the judgment was made by the Obama administration. It's better to be in the tent and have some influence on this whole operation rather than outside with none. Now, clearly, we haven't exercised enough influence to shape this properly, and we're also getting very much blamed by our association because of the arms sales and the intelligence But, but, but can, can the U.S., though, and other Western governments, you mentioned other Western governments from, yes. from whom the, the Saudi leadership buys those weapons, of course, France, the U.K., and others, mm -hmm. uh, could they absolve themselves of any moral responsibility? Is it time for something to change? I think everyone is beginning to see the fact that it, this, just this association with such a terrible humanitarian tragedy is going to be very difficult to kind of wipe clean. And I think our Congress is beginning to demonstrate a lot of impatience with the fact that they have been unable to impress upon the administration the importance of diminishing our association with such a misguided effort in Yemen. But how serious are the efforts to diminish this type of support when you've got a, a U.S. president who's all too willing to tweet his constant support and confidence in this uh, Saudi leader? Well, we'll see. Congress does have a role to play in weapon sales. And so perhaps in one week's time, uh, we'll see what the outcome of the midterm elections may be, but that may change the tenor of the tone and the composition of Congress in a way that would have an impact on the way we approach weapons sales in the future. When you last visited uh, Yemen, that was a few years ago. It was. What was the situation like then when you compare it to the images that you see of the destruction and the death and killing going on now? Well, the war was not on at that time. So it, it, was, it means it's a completely different scenario in the landscape now. And what we see now, and this is one of the issues, of course, Yemen is the forgotten war because we haven't had the terrible migration that we see coming out of Syria, for example, into Europe. Yemen has very much contained human suffering. And so, and the Saudis have controlled access to it in many respects. So a lot of the suffering has only recently begun to emerge as journalists begin to focus their attention on the situation inside of it. And journalists haven't, in fairness, been able to focus too much of their attention. Uh, surely they can use some of the images that we all get, but the Saudis haven't allowed them access to the country to really be able to document the gravity of the situation. That's very true. No, the Saudis do not want to have a lot of prying eyes in to really be able to some, get, get public opinion exercised in ways that has not quite achieved as yet. And, and in fairness, the Saudis are also trying to con control the narrative from all possible direction. Just today, uh, a leaked report from the United Nations shows the extent to which the Saudis were placing and exerting pressure on the United Nations and its humanitarian agency, OCHA, to, in exchange for the millions of dollars in so-called Yemen aid that the Saudis and their, um, their, their colleagues in the war in Yemen, the Emiratis, have given something to the tune of $930 million. In exchange for that money, they want good publicity. Well, I don't think the irony is left on anyone that the, the Saudis will go in and, and bomb the daylights out of Yemen one day and then come by the next day with a big check and say, oh, we're going to donate all this money to relieve the humanitarian disaster that we basically have created. But can they continue to get away with this? Uh, that's a $64,000 question. I just don't know at this point. I don't know how quickly this will be come to an end. I would love to see an outcome that would say, yes, tomorrow we're going to stop this war because the Saudis will come to their senses so or there will be pressure sufficiently built on them. But I don't see where that pressure is going to come from right now. Mm -hmm. I don't believe, as you said, it's going to come out of Washington at this point. It won't come out of Washington, you say, not out of the White House, but possibly out of Congress? Well, Congress is going to move a little more slowly than the White House. The White House could do this very quickly. But I don't believe, I, again, I believe the White House, this president, sees the Saudis and the Emiratis as basically conducting our foreign policy for us in Yemen. It is A, to push back hard against Iran and to push back hard against al-Qaeda and Arabian Peninsula's counterterrorism and Iran. If they're going to do that for us, we've outsourced our two basic foreign policy goals to our allies. We step back, we give them what they need, and that's fine with us. That's fine with this administration, the way they view it. Well, there are those, uh, including the former national security advisor, Susan Rice, who have come out and said the U.S. could not possibly continue to depend on someone like Mohammed bin Salman, who has shown, she says, his um, recklessness and moral 
incompetence, it doesn't make much sense for you as an ambassador who represents the United States around the world, does it make much sense from a national security perspective for the United States to still bank on MBS no matter what? I think it's a difficult calculation to make right now, given what we know about his behavior, both externally and internally, in terms of suppressing dissent um, quite broadly across Saudi Arabia, and then externally in Lebanon, in Yemen, the war in Yemen is a terrible miscalculation. So I think it's difficult for us to see how this young man who we had held up as a, as a reformer and as a visionary is demonstrating anything but really poor judgment and bad instincts. And I think that is the prevailing narrative now that it has attached itself to Mohammed bin Salman. Mohammed bin Salman knows very well the history of U.S.-Saudi relations. He knows how much the Saudi monarchy depends on U.S. Uh, protection. Why isn't the U.S. using more of that leverage against him? The U.S. has always had a calculation. This has always been a security for energy kind of calculation we've had with Saudi Arabia. Now, this is less true, perhaps, as we become more energy self-sufficient, not independent yet, because energy markets globally are very fungible. But I do think there's, there is a, a slow recalculation of how dependent we are on Saudi Arabia being made in this country. Are you concerned at all that the U.S. is being taken for granted, as many people have suggested, that MBS, the Saudi leadership, is displaying an increasing amount of confidence, cockiness, and just they, they feel comfortable in the knowledge that they will always have the, the, the backing of the United States. Well, I hope they don't feel that way, because I think with another administration, they might see things quite differently. And I think that that's kind of the sense of we always have them in our pocket. That might change uh, quite quickly, given another president, given another administration, given a different texture of Congress. Turning this around, do they have you in their pocket? Do they have? You, the United States, in their pocket. I hope not. I cannot imagine how that be the case. Ambassador Stephen Sesh, former U.S. Ambassador to Yemen, thanks very much indeed. My great pleasure. Thank you. And still ahead, we hear from one Saudi dissident who thinks only a miracle will bring down the crown prince. Mohammed bin Salman is the strongest Saudi leader ever. He has all the uh, ruling co components in his hand. And is America's love affair with Saudi Arabia just about arms sales and financial deals, or is it about something much, much bigger? <laughs> Well, it's no secret that the Saudis are big spenders here in the United States. Their financial ties have laid the foundation for a very cozy relationship between Riyadh and Washington. But just how much money is the kingdom pumping into the U.S. economy? Aus Haidari has our five facts. Saudi Arabia is the top U.S. weapons buyer. Between 2013 and 2017, Riyadh spent $9 billion on weapons from the United States. From the total U.S. arms sales around the world, Riyadh takes up 18%. Billions invested in U.S. tech companies. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman put $45 billion into a soft bank subsidiary called the Vision Fund, which made investments into NVIDIA, WeWork, Uber, DoorDash, Slack, and 21 others. Millions spent on lobbying each year. The Saudi government spent $10 million on U.S. lobbying in 2016. By 2017, that number tripled to $27 million. By comparison, Google spent $7 million between 2015 and 2017. 100 million U.S. dollars paid to the U.S. on October 16. The same day Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arrived in Riyadh to discuss the disappearance of Khashoggi, 100 million U.S. dollars landed in U.S. bank accounts. The Saudis said the money is for stabilization efforts in northeastern Syria. Saudi Arabia seeking nuclear reactors from the U.S. Riyadh is seeking approval from the Trump administration to have U.S. companies build 16 nuclear reactors at a price tag of $80 billion by 2023. For more on Saudi Arabia's influence in the United States, we're joined by Ben Freeman, the director and founder of the Foreign Influence Transparency Initiative at the Center for International Policy, Ben Freeman. We just heard the Saudis spent $27 million last year alone on trying to rebrand themselves and fix their image here in the United States. Where was most of the money spent and just how well did it pay off? Most of their money is spent in Congress and in the administration in what we would consider as traditional lobbying. And that's a lobbyist going into an office, asking a member of Congress to do something on behalf of their client. With the administration, this could mean arms sales. Uh, this could mean continuing U.S. involvement in the war in Yemen, 
or it could just mean the U.S. turning a blind eye to human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia. And you've got a very detailed account of the kinds of phone calls they put into some of these Congress members, the influence they tried to peddle as well in various media outlets. This new report that you've just come out with, the Saudi lobby, how the kingdom wins in Washington, there's a word of caution in it, though. You say Khashoggi's killing has placed, quote, a newfound and long overdue scrutiny on Saudi Arabia's influence operation in the U.S. How so? After the death of Jamal Khashoggi, a lot of America woke up to what Saudi Arabia actually is. And they saw through the talking points of this powerful lobby. They saw through the, the talking points of these PR firms that are working for the Saudis. And they saw the brutal murder of a man who was living in the United States and who was working for the Washington Post. And it also alerted them to a lot of other things the Saudis were doing, like bombing civilians in Yemen. And a lot of those bombings were occurring with US bombs. With all this brought to light, I think there's been a renewed focus on Saudi Arabia that we frankly haven't seen since 9-11. But just how much of a rethink, though, has there been? Because there are lots of lobbyists who are on the Saudi payroll here in Washington, DC. Uh, a handful of these lobbying firms have apparently cut their ties with the, the Saudis, but you yourself say there's a whole army of American lobbyists and public relations professionals out there working for the Saudis for years to cultivate a positive Saudi image and steer U.S. policy in their favor. How much of that has changed? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and unfortunately, not a lot has actually changed. There's been a lot in the press over here about the firms that have left the Saudis. What there hasn't been a lot of press on are the two dozen firms who haven't left the Saudis. They still have two dozen firms, lobbying and public relations firms, on their payroll, working feverishly right now to protect them. And what about members of Congress? Uh, do we rightly assume that the Saudis are hard at work trying to influence, trying to lobby members of Congress who are up for re-election just in under a week's time to try to push away the specter of sanctions against the Saudi Kingdom? Absolutely. If our report is any indication, the Saudi lobby right now is working absolutely feverishly to make sure Saudi Arabia doesn't get punished whatsoever for the death of Jamal Khashoggi. They're working feverishly to make sure arms sales keep flowing to Saudi Arabia and the U.S. keeps supporting the war in Yemen. And so this means, no doubt, pumping money into the coffers of some of these congressmen. Absolutely. What we found in our report um, was at least 12 instances where a lobbyist working for Saudi Arabia made a campaign contribution to a member of Congress on the exact same day they met with them to discuss Saudi Arabia. So you can bet right now in an election year when congressmen are just begging everyone for campaign contributions that some of these Saudi lobbyists are lining the coffers of some of these campaigns. And those who've at least said publicly that they will have nothing to do with Saudi Arabia, could they possibly just be lying low for a while and then before you know it, it'll be business as usual? Yeah, I think so. I think what you, you what often happens with Saudi Arabia and with other countries when you have an incident like this is there's an initial outcry um, and there, there, there's talk of punishment, but then we get distracted and, and, and we've had a lot of other major incidents soon and we have an election coming up, so there's definitely the possibility that nothing happens because of this, but I'm at least confident that in the lame duck session, Congress will do the right thing and punish Saudi Arabia for this. What about the narrative that's been crafted in the media? I mean, before uh, MBS's trip last March to the United States, we've mentioned this, he was hailed as the great reformer just about everywhere, every TV channel you turn right. to, every newspaper you picked up. He, to what extent is it possible to have an honest debate here in this country about Saudi Arabia when so many people are on the Saudi payroll? I mean, the, the, the case of MBS is, is the perfect example. He comes here and the narrative is that he's this great reformer. He's, he, he's this young prodigy who's just changing Saudi Arabia. What's missed in that entire narrative was this is a guy who less than a year before came to power literally via a palace coup who had, he had detained a number of political opponents in a hotel and tortured some of them. And this is certainly not a reformer who the United States should want to be friends with. And he apparently came to power at the behest of President Trump and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. How deep, how pervasive are the, the financial ties between all three of them? The Trump administration has decades-long relationships with Saudi Arabia. For at least two decades that we know of, they have had business interests in Saudi Arabia. During the campaign, we know that the Trump organization it started multiple businesses within the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, so to say that they're entrenched uh, personal interests for the Trump administration and the Saudis, I think that would be an understatement. 
Um, we've seen it even more now um, after the death of Jamal Khashoggi. What is Trump's defense of Saudi Arabia? It again goes back to business interests. It again goes back to uh, arms sales and, and the, the illusion of creating jobs in America from these arms sales. So where does it all go from here? In my opinion, Trump is going to continue to do everything he can to try and whitewash this issue, to try and get the Saudis off the hook. We've seen nothing from the Trump administration to say that they're committed to punishing them. And w what we've seen from Congress, we've seen a lot of bluster, we've seen a lot of anger, but we've yet to actually see any action. It's up to Congress to force the president's hand on this and to punish, uh, to punish uh, Saudi Arabia for the death of Jamal Khashoggi. And, and speaking of Jamal Khashoggi, was his very downfall the fact that he was able to write in the Washington Post that he had this uh, far-reaching and very wide readership at his disposal, American, English-based, uh, and that he was able to interfere with this very well-resourced effort to craft the narrative around MBS. That's absolutely right. What, what we know from the Saudis is that if there is ever a narrative that's counter to what their lobbying and PR machine is spinning, then we, we, we have seen them very aggressively go after that counter narrative. Um, we've certainly never seen it at the level of Jamal Khashoggi from murder on for, foreign soil. Um, this was just a step above and beyond anything they had ever done before. Um, and I think rightly so, we need to send a message to them that it's not an okay level for them to take it to. Ben Freeman, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Saudi Arabia's spending power may explain President Trump's reluctance to condemn the Saudi leadership, a position that isn't shared by the majority of the American public. An online poll by Axios Media found that 56% of Americans view Trump's response to Saudi Arabia as not tough enough, while 32% consider it about right. Well, we went to the streets of Washington to gauge the mood in the U.S. Capitol and hear directly from local voices. The worst of all, because they buy our weapons, that means we have to stay in an alliance with this regime. Shame. There should be no sacred bond between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, absolutely not. The Saudis don't deserve it, the United States, it's not in our interests, and we, the American people, have to demand that we totally change our relationship with Saudi Arabia. And you know what? I think if there is a silver lining from the death of Jamal Khashoggi, it could be a recalibration of U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia. We have a very important uh, relationship because I know we import a lot of oil from them and we would be very dependent on the oil. And uh, they import a lot of weapons from us, which they would need. And they're uh, another factor in the Middle East because um, they're a very important, they have a very important role there. Th there's ways of dis expressing displeasure with the Saudi government without terminating the arms deals, without terminating oil commerce, without terminating our diplomatic relations. We, we have to uh, uh, have justice and truth as the top priority in any relationship with any government in the world. We want to see the United States end all military support and arms sales to the Sa Saudi regime in its war against Yemen, which is a war crime. If this crime happened with another government, there would be hell to pay. There would already be sanctions imposed. There would already be a cutoff in diplomatic relations. The ambassadors would have been recalled. Uh, the economic sanctions would have been imposed. Perhaps the air flights would have been stopped. I mean, all kinds of things would have taken place. So why then is the House of Saud receiving the royal treatment from the Trump White House? Is it the lucrative financial deals and billion dollar arms sales or Saudi Arabia's emergence as the linchpin of Trump's Middle East strategy of containing Iran. Ambassador Thomas Pickering was an Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs under President Clinton. He is also a former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. And Trita Parsi is the founder of the National Iranian American Council. He's also the author of Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. Ambassador Pickering, let's just imagine for one moment that Iran had been behind this gruesome killing. What would have happened? How long would it have taken the Trump White House to unleash all kinds of sanctions against About it? About two seconds. Uh, the U.S. approach to Iran now is demonization, not a policy. And in many senses, that means that 
There is a national attitude which has developed, I think most unfortunately, that r Iran is responsible for every bad thing and therefore deserves to be constantly punished, not talked to, cajoled, pressured, and all the other things. Uh, someday we may see a repeat of North Korea uh, and the president may wake up and, and find that his offer to talk with the Iranians has actually been accepted. But I think it'll be a long time. Saudi Arabia is, of course, a different matter a long-standing relationship of great importance to the United States and great significance to President Trump, even though the dollar figures on the sales seem to be wildly inflated, uh, he's hung on. But he's not hung on with the same skill that a mountain climber going up a slippery cliff hangs on. We've seen shifts over the last week and a half uh, from pretty much I have to do everything I can to preserve the relationship that this is really a horrible thing and we have to get to the bottom of it. A horrible thing, but not major likelihoods is there, are there that things might change. Uh, Trita Parsi, you heard Ambassador Pickering talk about, I'm not sure we can call it a policy, but certainly a strategy toward the Middle East of demonizing Iran and holding Saudi Arabia in a very tight embrace. Yes, but th there's one thing there that I think is kind of interesting because many people are putting forward, and I think in your question you suggested that Trump needs Saudi Arabia in order to uh, be able to contain Iran or pursue this Iran policy or Iran demonization. Reality is Trump and the United States do not need Saudi Arabia because the United States doesn't need this policy. The United States doesn't need to have a confrontation with Iran. It could have continued the diplomacy that Obama had put in place, a nuclear deal that was fully functioning, and it could have resolved the remaining issues with Iran because clearly there are other issues left through diplomatic efforts. The reason it went for containment or confrontation is partly because of the pressure from Saudi Arabia. It's Saudi Arabia that needs the United States for confrontation. And because of Not Israel. Not the United States that needs Saudi Arabia. Be because of Israel, clearly. I mean, these are the two pillars of the Trump White House strategy. Certainly, and, and Israel is the, the other pillar in, in all of this. But I think it's important to walk back this notion that Trump has managed to Establish in which he has so much given up America's leverage that we're now talking about as if the U.S. needs Saudi for a strategy that the U.S. doesn't need to in the first place. Who's got the, the biggest uh, leverage, as, as you hear Trita Parsi mention? The U.S., I think, has far more leverage over the Saudis and the other way around. I, is this confrontation with Iran in their national interest? I think first it, there's a third pillar, and that's anything but Obama. It may be a weakened pillar, but it's serious. Uh, I think the question is who has more leverage, the U.S. or Saudi Arabia? Obviously, the U.S. does. And the whole future of Mohammed bin Salman, in many ways, seems uh, increasingly and in inextricably intertwined with the United States' support for him and where he's going. And so the question here is Mohammed bin Salman, the savior of the Middle East, or is he in some ways in deeper trouble, perhaps even at home in Saudi Arabia, where those he hasn't arrested on a permanent basis uh, are forming, at least in the press eyes and in their own briefings of the press, an alternative arrangement. And would that alternative arrangement, as a result of this episode and the others that have been recounted, Yemen, uh, certainly Canada, uh, the Ritz-Carlton, if I could paraphrase them, Qatar, and so on, are these people going to, at one point, resist the notion that he could become king? And one of the interesting things is I think that were the king to abdicate, he would have much more power over those in the family, the Allegiance Council, who will make the decision. And perhaps even more importantly, because the Allegiance Council is a new institution, the influential members of the family who in one way or another will help through the informal network in Saudi Arabia to determine the kingship. Right. Or should the king die, would Mohammed Solman be a little bit left out to hang out to dry? And yeah, these, and are, these are interesting questions. Now, it's very it, hard to tell. It's a very it opaque it, it, society. Ron, I totally agree with, with uh, Trita. Uh, and the notion that we should walk away from an agreement that we had negotiated that provides a real opportunity to block uh, Iranian nuclear development, which after all has to be in the fundamental interest of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia doesn't need a nuclear uh, neighbor in Iran. A and now, in fact, their pressure uh, and certainly that of Bibi Netanyahu, I won't say Israel because mm -hmm. there's a dispute in Israel on this, has sort of opened the door when Iran would like to, to go back to a military nuclear program if it so chose. And it's hard to know if there are any serious shifting sands and shifting dynamics, Trita Parsi, in the kingdom itself. But when it comes to Iran, 
what are you hearing? What is your sense? Because Iran so far has been quite happy to sit back and let Saudi Arabia's position unravel before the whole world. What are the political calculations being made in Tehran right well, now? One of the calculations, I would assume, is that the Iranians have been quite astute at taking advantage of their competitors' mistakes. Mm -hmm. That includes the United States, in which the Iranians have taken advantage of some of the mistakes the U.S. has committed in the region, such as invading Iraq. What they're good at is to stay out when their enemies are shooting themselves in the foot. I don't think the U.S. is as good at that because we have a political culture here in which we believe we always have to be involved. Uh, the Iranians are much better at restraining themselves and letting the Saudis look tremendously bad uh, internationally, in Europe, everywhere. And they understand, of course, themselves quite well that if they had thrown themselves into the mix, it would probably have backfired. Mm -hmm. and they had the discipline of restraining them. There's been no knee-jerk reaction in Iran. Ambassador Pickering, when we look at the common Saudi-Israeli obsession with Iran, the notion that we need regime change, that we cannot deal with a strong, independent Iran in, 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 the, in the region, is it likely to happen? Are we likely to see a diminishing of Iran's regional power without the United States getting involved and potentially even going to war? But I think you asked several questions. Regime change is a triumph of hope over reality. That won't happen. Certainly not in anything like the near future, particularly, in fact, if Iran feels besieged uh, by opponents, whether they're Israel or, or Saudi Arabia or both. So I think that's important. Will Iran change its point of view? I think that'll be a careful calculation made in Iran, depending on the circumstances. If Iran can keep up the benefits uh, of the nuclear agreement, then it has a lot of interest in keeping the nuclear agreement. And I think that's an important contribution to the change. But what's really important here is what Trita said. The person who is gaining most out of this is President Erdogan. President Erdogan has played this like a Stradivarius violin in a fine concert. And I'm not an admirer of President Erdogan in that sense, but I have to admire his skill in dealing with this. He's, and he clearly he's led on the Saudis. Mm -hmm. At every time they made a statement about what actually happened, he eked out a little more clear information that it never took place that way. So he moved them from trap to trap to trap. And he's got them now in a position where he's pressing them to have a trial in Turkey. And there's no doubt that Turkey will want to play a more important regional role, uh, certainly when it comes to the United States reliance on, on Turkey in sure. the future. But it's obviously not an alternative to Saudi Arabia, uh, Trita Parsi. How will all of this fit together when it comes to, for example, as well, what General Mattis, the defense secretary, has said, that this killing has the potential to undermine the stability of the entire region? Um, more than anything else, I would say that it would start off by having an impact on the Saudi-U.S. relationship. And from there on, of course, it can have a significant impact on the region as a whole. And even though there's going to be very strong interest in the United States that would want to keep the relationship as is, are willing to turn a blind eye to what MBS has done, uh, and be extremely forgiving of the very superficial reforms and changes that MBS might put into place uh, in order to put this uh, killing behind him. But if that happens, I suspect that you are going to see the Saudi-U.S. relationship becoming an issue of a partisan fight in the United States, in which the Democrats will very much target that relationship and see that as uh, um, uh, a rallying cry for their own foreign policy. The Saudis have already lost much of the Democratic Party. They will lose almost all of it if there isn't a real change in Saudi Arabia. And just very briefly, the common view in the region, at least, bringing a lot of these Gulf nations together, Saudi Arabia and the smaller Gulf states, coming together around, coalescing around the common threat that is, in their mind, Iran. That is not Actually, likely to I don't think that is the case. I think the common threat, frankly, is that some of the smaller GCC states really fear Saudi Arabia. And they're playing along with this Iran threat thing because they're afraid of Saudi Arabia. They don't have the ability and the freedom to be able to break free from that. And particularly right now, after seeing what Saudi tried to do with Qatar, if they had succeeded and Qatar had foiled, Kuwait, potentially Oman, would have been next. And this is something they were very worried about. Trita Parsi and Ambassador Thomas Thanks. Pickering, thank you both very much. Thank you. Well, the U.S. administration is investing heavily in its geostrategic partnership with the Saudi Kingdom and its de facto leader, Mohammed bin Salman. But could the lingering suspicion surrounding him be a tipping point 
Ali Al Ahmad is a Saudi scholar and expert in Saudi affairs at the Institute for Gulf Affairs here in Washington. He shares his thoughts on how the power of the Crown Prince is playing out inside the kingdom. Yeah, the condition in Saudi Arabia at this moment are the worst ever in the, in the country's history. The environment of fear uh, is the highest ever. The people in the country uh, publicly support the government line. Uh, privately, obviously, they are disgusted and horrified by this crime. The online uh, discussions are uh, much more uh, open than the, the public. But even then, because Saudi Arabia has employed and has a great capacity in monitoring the social media, the people are fearful, uh, given the fact that even if you have a fake name, the government somehow uh, is able to find you because they have one of the best, or uh, they have the best uh, software, surveillance software that was sold to them by the Obama administration. I don't think many people believe MBS is a reformer. In our country, now Mohammed bin Salman is the strongest Saudi leader ever. He has all the uh, ruling co components in his hand. He has the security and military in, in one hand, and the economic uh, and the political in the other hand. Uh, the only people who are using the word reformer are mostly American writers and pundits and politicians who are willing to do anything to, for a buck. Even King Salman is not aware of what's going on and he does not have the power and the capacity at his age and at his health state to do much. Only a miracle will take Mohammed bin Salman out. And so despite all the mounting evidence pointing in one direction, many here in the United States are becoming increasingly despondent that even this brazen crime likely ordered from high above would not shake or even test the decades-old U.S.-Saudi alliance. An alliance that continues to be driven by realpolitik, vested interests, oil, and big money. And while many are demanding the truth, for now, the rule of law and accountability will, in all likelihood, take a back seat while President Trump and his White House continue to protect their cozy affair. From all the team here in Washington, and from me, Rida Fakhri, thanks for watching.